Hello, welcome to section 7, where we'll discuss band structure in 1D periodic potentials. So, in the previous section, we talked about tunneling through multiple barriers, and uh, this tool really showed nicely how you can um, have transmissions in bands, this uh, PCPBT tool on NanoHub, and um, you could see how there were bands forming there, uh, the, uh, deep in the wells, there were narrow bands, and uh, the bands got wider and uh, got broad and closer to the top of the barriers. Um, so tunneling was treated explicitly in an open system approach with a transfer matrix. In this section, we'll uh, aim for quasi-infinite systems. Of course, you can't truly make it infinite, but there's a, a trick, an analytical trick you can do to make it look infinite. And what you'll see is that the solutions that are emerging are similar to what you've seen in a finite uh, barrier structure. So we'll talk about a problem formulation, uh, we'll discuss some solutions, and then um, uh, discuss the band properties in more detail. So let's uh, uh, look at uh, what we've seen in the last section one more time. Two barriers, uh, one resonance uh, corresponding to one uh, quantum well that is in the middle of the structure. And uh, we had uh, a case where we had three barriers, two resonances, and uh, we had uh, the case of n barriers, n minus one resonances, and we had these bands emerging. So for 10 barriers, 20 barriers, and 30 barriers. There were really resonances emerging, a bandpass filter, if that meant something to you as an electrical engineer. So as the number of barriers increased, more and more energy resonances began to appear, and they formed a band. Again, the question that could emerge is, what if the number of bands would be infinite? Would that be almost a continuous line? And in realistic systems, uh, you could argue if you have a true solid where you have 10 to the 23 atoms, um, that's a very large number that is a quasi-continuum. But how can you model or devise a methodology where you can't do that explicitly? So um, this is where uh, an analytical process can start again, uh, where we have an ansatz to the solution to the Schrodinger equation that we want to solve. Uh, we have boundary conditions, um, and here's the recipe that we used uh, for a closed system and our analytical solution for a particle in a box. Now, if we want to modify this for an open system, I had shown that in the last segment, where we modify the boundary conditions. So we replace the closed system boundary conditions by open boundary conditions, and uh, we did not pursue the approach of calculating coefficients to a um, determinant coefficient matrix, and uh, we also didn't calculate the absolute magnitude of these wave functions. Now, we're going to do something different. We're going to uh, calculate a periodic boundary condition, and that uh, means we replace our boundary condition at the edges again. There's something called uh, a Bloch theorem. Uh, this is from Felix uh, Bloch. Um, I guess in the English pronunciation is Bloch. Um, this person was a Swiss-American scientist. And um, what we'll also uh, do is uh, modify the uh, interface boundary conditions slightly. All right. And um, we'll, we do uh, pursue, uh, again, this uh, determinant uh, to, uh, to do determine the coefficients, or we pursue a numerical solution. All right, so let's look at this uh, periodic potential in more detail. Uh, we're interested in a structure that is, uh, in, in an ideal sense, infinitely repeated. But of course, we, we can't do it in, in infinity. We'll um, focus on a single unit cell. That's the smallest basis set, so to speak, that we can pursue very easily and that will uh, re reduce the computational burden or our analytical burden and the number of boundary conditions that we'll need to use. All right, so let's focus on this. Um, we, we have already experience in choosing an ansatz for a solution of a problem. 
Um, we, are we have seen in the past that if you're uh, above a barrier, that a sinusoidal or a complex exponential is, is a good solution uh, for the problem. And if you're inside uh, uh, barriers, uh, that uh, you have a, an exponential decay. So that's, those are pretty good uh, starting points for a solution. And we'll, we'll dive into an almost real problem now that solves the periodic structure. So we will redefine a unit length uh, cell L that consists of a barrier uh, of a well that um, has length A and a barrier that has length B. And we'll define solutions in the system where the ansatz for a solution inside of the barrier are uh, complex uh, growing and decaying coefficients. And inside the, the, the well, uh, we assume an ansatz where we have uh, complex exponentials or sinusoids. All right, so we have uh, n atoms, we have two uh, times n unknowns, and uh, we need to find the coefficients. So for large n, that would be a pretty complicated uh, problem to solve. And uh, what we'll do is, uh, we have something called the periodic boundary condition. All right, so this potential we have under the hood, so to speak, is repeated for each unit cell length L. Uh, it's the same potential. So the underlying wave function should have a symmetry that is related to the periodic uh, potential. And intuitively, we know that the wave function should be repeated. The magnitude square of the wave function should be periodic with the same period length. So the electron density should really not vary in the, uh, uh, spatially in this form. So if the magnitude square is the same, then uh, if you relate the wave function uh, of a neighboring site um, to the wave function on the original site, there could be a complex phase shift that has to do with the, uh, the length L uh, that is being repeated in this, in this geometry. Okay, so notice that this K is not the same uh, momentum K that we had uh, before. Um, it's a slightly different K. All right, so now let's look at this geometry where we are trying to calculate uh, psi uh, throughout the device. And we know that uh, the psi should have a symmetry that is related uh, uh, to the next uh, unit block um, by some complex uh, factor. So if we look at that in the next side, again, we should pick up a similar phase or complex factor as well. And there should be, a, a, it should be the double the phase to the next cell. And as, if you go out all the way to the end, you should pick up the same phase factor all the way to the end of the, uh, the period. Now you can imagine that you can relate as, an, uh, as a system that is really infinitely large, you can have this Gedanken experiment, a German word for just a, a thought experiment, that you could connect this infinite chain at the back ends to itself and form a ring. And so you have a ring of these um, uh, dots. And what you know is that at the uh, linkage of the ring, the wave function needs to be exactly the same again. So that imposes a, a quantization, so to speak, or selection of this vector of k, that e to the i k l n needs to be um, coming out to a 2 pi multiple of 2 pi. So that really imposes a periodicity on this geometry that is de really depending on the, on the fictitious number of capital N unit cells that you consider. This capital N, you can make any which length you want, but for this numerical approach to work, you, you pick one and consistently carry it through the calculation. And we'll see how this large capital N carries through the, the calculation. All right, 
what is unique here is that uh, k-min, uh, that, that the, the wave number k has a value uh, that is, has a minimal and a maximum value and it ranges as pi over L, where L is the, the length of a single unit cell as we had discussed here. So the length L here of a single cell. All right. So now let's translate that concretely into our problem setup. So again, we are assuming that um, uh, we have a wave function ansatz that has a uh, exponential like this. And we have coefficients that we need to match uh, at these um, at these positions of uh, uh, position zero here at this interface. And then at the either equivalent interface here or here to close the box. Okay. So uh, we know that the wave function needs to be continuous, say at side zero here, and the differential of the wave function needs to be continuous as well. So that means if you have a solution ansatz that exists here of um, capital A sine beta x plus capital B cosine beta x. And now we have indices uh, A and A on these Bs here. You know that at this interface for x equal to zero, this coefficient falls away. And that means B, B A must be B B. And then you can do the same thing with the differential and you find that alpha A needs to be alpha uh, beta uh, A, A, B, A B. All right, now we do the same thing for the other interface. We need to match to the periodic cell on the other side and pick up this phase factor. So we need to make sure that we pick up a phase factor that is shifted, where the wave function on the other side is now shifted by this e to the i k l, and the differential is also then shifted in this form. All right. So that means for this side minus b or plus a here, you need to match the, the wave function and the differential, but now you include the phase factor. All right. So that means you have again uh, four equations for, for unknowns. And that's a game we've played before uh, for the particle that is uh, loosely bound in a quantum well. So we're following the same methodology, except now it's in a quasi-infinite or periodic cell. So we cast this expression again in a matrix form. And in this matrix form, we can find a uh, somewhat analytical solution. Um, but um, it is uh, rather complicated looking. And uh, you only get an analytic expression to find the solution you need to use a graphical methodology or a, a numerical methodology to find the roots of these uh, equations. Um, similar to what we had before, it is useful to define a, a unitless quantity psi that normalizes the energy of the electron versus the, the height of this barrier here called u in this case. And the propagation constant and in this case, the decay constant in the barrier is 2m u0 h bar squared. All right. So what we do is we um, uh, modify the boundary conditions here to be periodic. And we modify the boundary conditions here um, to, uh, to, to enable us to look at the unit cell. We calculate the determinant matrix as we did before, and we get a solution to it that looks reasonably horrendous. And uh, in general, we don't mess around uh, with uh, uh, determining the final coefficient. So these are the five steps for a periodic system to get an analytical solution. And uh, next, we will uh, uh, look at some actual solutions in the next segment. So. Thank you, and we'll move to the next segment.